Is microphone working? Yeah, it seems great. Well, wonderful to be here. Uh, thanks for being Hans Hermann to invite me. Um, I'm an architect. I s make a slightly unusual presentation. I will give a lot of hints, a lot of ideas, and later on we have a discussion about those, I hope. Uh, just to introduce myself, I'm an architect, I'm a kick-ass entrepreneur, I'll show you that. Uh, we've been growing rapidly uh, for 10 years, from the mid-90s to the 2000s, late 2000s, uh, before the crash, from 10 to 450. The crash turned me into a libertarian, because that's for the compelling um, uh, explanations from the Austrian school. And in the last 10 years, I've been ever more becoming impatient with what's going on. I've been radicalized, because I want to continue to develop a flourishing business. It's very, very hard if you have 10 years of stagnation all over Europe. So just go through some of the images, you don't explain too much, the kind of work we're doing, very innovative around the world. And I'll make that super fast. It's just a little introduction who we are. Our buildings appear on the map of various places, mass media attention, uh, top Google referencing, etc. But we're doing lots of big things ur on urban scale. You can see here, um, we're doing um, cultural buildings, commercial buildings, anything. This is my urbanism. Very large scale ventures around the world, um, transport. Sorry about this, I'm just giving you a few glimpses to give, gain credibility. <laughs> We're doing Beijing Airport at the moment. Most of our work in Asia and Middle East, by the way, nothing in Europe. We were in every single city of Spain, Italy, and France with our works. And um, major operations uh, before the crash in various European countries. Uh, opera houses, Asia, Middle East. This is our project in Azerbaijan, which became very famous. So I'm just going quickly through this extraordinary, unusual buildings. And just give it to you like this. Uh, starting on the cultural domain, but also branching out into commercial, mixed use, residential, anything you like. Um, or including government, I have to admit that. Um, research, education, commercial. Just give you a glimpse of what I'm up to. Major large towers all over Asia, unusual, sophisticated geometry uh, feats in, in, in large and larger buildings as we, as we continue. But again, I say, oh, well, as a company, we've been stagnating in terms of size. And so this is residential. And, um, but also we brand gold interiors, um, furniture, products, fashion, so universal design, global design brand. So that's what I, my kind of day job. <laughs> but um, in terms of my intellectual work, as I said, um, I became kind of libertarian, also economics, political economy interests me, but I was always interested in how society operates, uh, politics, economics, and also how this ties back to architecture. So I want to start with a kind of deep anthropological thesis about what the built environment does, for me it's an, it's an engine of societal evolution. I've written about this, so the built environment is for me a kind of ordering of social processes. Instrument for structuring human activity, under the headline of course of cooperation and the vision of labor, and that needs to be structured societal um, 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 build up, the cumulative build up of societal complexity needs some kind of substrate, cross generational stable physical material substrate, and that's the built environment, which can accrue cross generations and build up societal complexity, uh, but also there's an element of communication uh, to this, not only physical sorting us, but also we need as sentient beings to be recognized and conspicuously find each other in various situations. So social order requires spatial order, and it is a kind of substrate of societal evolution beyond biological evolution. And so these are very, very critical uh, instruments which a crew which distribute activities, which distribute status groups and allow society to gain complexity and build up gradually, without design, bottom up, evolve societal complexity for cooperation. And I want to emphasize this relative to Hans Hermann's work. Uh, the emphasis here is on demarcation and dedication, designation of territory, not so much on appropriation of property, although that, of course, is also important. So my emphasis is not on scarcity and conflict resolution, but on social cooperation, organization, and the stabilization of social relationships. Of course, conflict resolution then comes as a second order important phenomenon, but the built environment 
uh, is doing this, and it is doing this by creating these recognizable divisions, separations, distributions, and can routinize social interactions. <laughs> and then it has a kind of graphic overlay to, to is games a kind of semiological code, some of the text, a language which we're navigating the social world through. And this also includes the way we manipulate ourselves into various status groups, become recognizable, kind of uniforms or, or social roles demarcations. So, and all of this is design, built environment design, product design, self design. And that differentiates, this is kind of becoming human precisely through these means. And this is not a waste of energy, this is an absolute necessity, otherwise we wouldn't expend scarce resources on these kind of systems. They become a, a, a human becoming necessary subsystems, as it were, and there's no human society without this. And this continues, so it's about framing and differentiating human actors through spatial differentiation, recognizable, and through the marking also of the various personas. Everybody in, in his or her place and that's kind of order and the place for everything. And this kind of can grow, grow from through concentric materially into ever larger uh, systems. Uh, typical uh, uh, evil city, which then spreads thousand fold across the European landscape uh, with, with, with its various social organs, but also a cruel ability. And, and then at a certain point, there's a kind of shock of conscious taking the over and participating. When you draw up as an ideal city what has evolved and now you are in a simulated world of graphics, representation, critique, theory and discourse at a time when there also political discourse emerges, literatures emerge and architecture is part of this. So we very, very quickly can reproduce this according to plan and I'm talking about spatial order and social order but there's also interestingly, these become key models of conceptual orders. It's the Renaissance, all these kind of tableaus and and, and a kind of sorting diagrams, classification is basically the physical sorting, and then abstracted into, and language evolves together with the physical sorting. So there's a kind of deep anthropological potency of the built environment of architecture, and the way it evolves through various stages of socioeconomic uh, evolution. So you can see, in a sense, the registration of society moving on an, organizing itself on an ever larger scale, and, and shaping the built environment on an ever larger scale. So this is a kind of absolutist, state mercantilism stage beyond the, what was originally the, in the Renaissance kind of early capitalist uh, individual city states into larger territories. And the Baroque comes onto this. And we have, I'm jumping ahead, the mechanical uh, system of mechanical mass reproduction, modernism and industrial revolution has its look and shape and architecture and discourse attached to this, uh, <coughs> which is kind of modernism and the Bauhaus that we discussed earlier. And there's a certain set of principles at place here which is uh, again, a strong division, separation, specialization, repetition as the principles of that, both on the cityscape and on the uh, architectural scape, this is the Bauhaus itself. And the way this ties in with a certain type of corporate organization, kind of departmentalization, separation, specialization, repetition, and this you can, you can read off the social organization into the spatial organization as its apparatus. And this is also the era, of course, of and we discussed this of mass mechanical reproduction, industrialization, electrification, a very simple form of industrial society which becomes compatible to a certain degree with planning, although I'm very anti-planning now. Historically, I have to recognize that in a in certain part of the mid-20th century, forms of planning were at least viable to some extent. And Brasilia is an outcome of that. And again, um, this is mechanical mass reproduction. It exists under capitalism, it exists under socialism, but both these systems go more and more into planning um, uh, conditions. But that collapses. And that is, is collapsed by, I think, the underlying uh, technologies and potentials which have built up in terms of the microeconomic revolution. Uh, this whole idea of post fallism I'm not sure if you're familiar with this discourse. Flexible specialization, much more innovation, research, development, marketing, financing, projects by project instead of 10 years of a universal consumption standard with everybody in the same cornflakes, the same house, the same washing machine, there's one TV channel. And that was very, very stable. You could separate it out, suburbanize, and put everybody in their place. And now we're talking about much faster cycles. We have to, to communicate, interact, research, develop, market, finance, etc. So I think that uh, this kind of new era breaks through, that's why I have the neoliberal revolution and we have these, and the Soviet Union finally collapses, can no longer co compete and we have a new epoch which I think the search of 
free market ideas come to, come to, to, come to bear. And the Hayek, as we discovered, becomes a great icon for Thatcher, Reagan, etc. And this, moving from this kind of system to, <laughs> to this kind of agglomeration on dynamism uh, of bottom-up, postmodernism is, is, gives, ex, gives kind of a face to this, an expression, diversity, uh, collage, complexity build up. And uh, I want to just throw in in between, because we're talking about planning and order, simple order, that to some extent there's, this could also be, I'm talking anti-planning, but I'm talking, I allow for private planning. If you look at the great estates in London, the way London was developed in the 17th and, sorry, 18th and 19th century, it was actually private planning, series of district, just as an intercepting. That's the way I'm thinking. I'm thinking of trying to align the great styles of architecture with a kind of um, series of ch uh, uh, transformations of socioeconomic orders. And the line here, the Renaissance with early capitalism and city-states, the Baroque with mercantilism and absolutism. The bourgeois capitalism has kind of this neoclassical historicist revolution in the 19th century. Modernism is Fordism, international socialism, or kind of corporatism of sorts. And parametrism is now, I think, that new style I'm talking about, it. Uh, I don't know too, too much about it, that new that level of dynamism, complexity, a new way of working, a new way of, of conceiving the city under what I call global post fordist network society. Uh, I still believe that capitalism was incredibly important, that it is the kind of engine of, of prosperity engine of, and of modernity engine. And now we're having this kind of condition, the kind of agglomerative, uh, uh, unplanned, dynamism, city of London, uh, very, very different picture from this kind of new towns, well-ordered, well-planned. There's a kind of, uh, of course, planners try to hang on. They just interfere and interrupt. They don't plan anymore. They just kind of constrain this. Uh, but there's no way anybody would recognize this as being kind of planned rationally. It's just, uh, and, and this contemporary urban concentration is, is basically that we had 50 years of distributing out in the suburbs, green fields separate, nine to five routines, everybody, and now we kind of have this kind of reconcentration into mega cities. And that's the challenge. And that new dy dynamism, I think, aligns with Neoliberalism and ideally calls, I think, much more than ever before for anarcho-capitalism or totally freed up uh, uh, interaction processes. So, uh, and I'm just showing how this um, uh, new world and dynamic uh, with these fast cycles of innovation and global integration, there's no way that bureaucrats of any shape or form uh, have any role in this, except when we become huge breaks on these next productivity potentials. And I think the whole thing for me is when you now is you need entrepreneurs to, for every site, is a new condition, novelty, new project, new clients, new connections, new demands, and you pick up a site and you, and you, and you tease out the synergy potentials which you find and intuit and test profit and loss system feedback. You try something, somebody else comes up with them better. You need that le totally letting loose. You can't plan this anymore. It's a kind of bottom up evolving very, very complex machine, because not no longer kind of making the cornflakes cheaper and, and having uh, the electrification three miles further out, very, very different things happening. But I'm looking at these kind of city agglomerations, and uh, what is happening here is, of course, that they become menacing and chaotic. I'm talking about garbage fill urbanization. So there's a sense of lack of order and, and, and chaos, but it's much better than this kind of neat and, and sterile order. But there's also something problematic, because I said we need the built environment is an ordering and structuring and text and communicating, telling everybody where is what and how to gather and what kind of conditions. So there's a kind of problem with this, which is a kind of a lack of articulated order. And that's what is one of my uh, conditions where I'm working on. If you look at these cities, they're just endless spills, amorphous spills. The only thing which shaped in order is, is the river, if you like. And that's why I'm looking at natural systems where you can have complex, intricate, variegated order um, which, which, where you can have variety, adaptivity, and yet you have navigability and, 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 and order rather than disorder and chaos and random distribution. So we do making cityscapes like that. So inherently flexible and open, but always identity giving and structured and not random. <laughs> and and uh, it's a kind of multi-species ecology metaphor. You grow a city with all these interventions coming in in a rule-based way, integrating, weaving in, making connections and making legible. So these are our kind of model of what I call a parametric urbanism. It's driven by algorithms. So that new level of intricate interconnectedness and teasing out and making resonances is all kind of algorithmic driven uh, design variation. Complexities are parametric models. They can shift and adapt. These, they're not 
uh, uh, the, the order is not a complete and symmetrical and, and easily corruptible. It's a very robust, flexible, like organic creatures, like swarm formations of creatures. And uh, so I'm looking at these uh, kind of projects as being adapting into conditions, multiple levels, and, and, and being ever incomplete, but always recognizable and, and shape giving and identity giving. Uh, so this is my, and, and we do these kind of projects. Multiple authors can come together under paradigm and integrate with each other. You don't need the master hand. You don't need an overall hand. It could be a total bottom-up process because these natural systems, which are integrated and ordered and navigable for much dumber creatures as us, they can find each other because everything links to everything else. The topography, the river, the water flows relative to the topography, the, the, the various vegetations pick up on these differentiations, sunlight and shade. The fauna comes in, so everything links up in a system of networks and retrievable, and that's, I think, one can have a built environment like this, which we can also later on intuitively navigate. So these are multiple authors integrating, and these are scripts feeding various subsystems uh, according to rules, uh, kind of quasi-natural rules. That's the kind of vision of an architecture. And this idea of simultaneity, that we want to network, have hundreds of opportunities and offerings in our face to pick and quickly move from one meeting to another, never missing out, you come into a building and you're not kind of hidden in a corridor or, or, or elevator or cell. Thousands of people all in each other's face, inter-aware, interactive, quick, 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 a very productive multi-communication um, uh, interaction um, uh, environment. And I think that can only be delivered by, by private ventures. The bureaucrats don't have the knowledge, they don't have the incentive. Uh, they're far too slow. Uh, you have to hold hands with a majority to get anything done. It's, it's totally bankrupt. That you could do when, you, when, you, when, when things remain stable for 20 years. When it's just about, in 20 years, we're still doing the cornflakes, the washing machine, uh, the, the TV channel. Uh, BBC is maybe moved from BBC One to BBC Two, but we're not an explosion of 100 channels and then 1,000 YouTube channels. Uh, so, so, but, so that's my argument is that this can be only done by private. And our ideologies are so kind of stifled and backward. I put myself out there and got kind of hammered and defamed for, for, for instance, saying the privatization of everything, streets, squares, public spaces. And, and, and these are still public, public offerings. There would be huge diversity of open spaces uh, for various niche markets and the multiple audiences that we are, not bringing everything to the average, dumb, stupid, median voter and, and wasting all these resources. So I'm looking at this, but there's, of course, if you look in the media, a huge kind of hostility to anything private, particularly when it comes to the urban condition. And I'm recognizing that these things in an urban condition, there's kind of um, uh, synergies and externalities, but private systems would derive them. So you have the Guardian kind of crying out against uh, public space privatization, uh, pseudo-public spaces, totally ideological, and I'm starting to combat that. Um, and these are examples that, that we go through is, is major developments uh, various parks, public spaces, retail spaces, interior, exterior, um, 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 everything private. But the Guardian thinks, thinks, oh, how horrible, because we can't demonstrate uh, in these places. We, the Occupy movement couldn't be in these spaces, and that's why it's a kind of breakdown of society. <laughs> um, so, so um, and this, they're kind of charting these and, and vilifying all of, all of these kind of public spaces, which I celebrate, and uh, should, we should be, have much more. Of course, these are also private, but they're over-regulated. They're not really set loose. We, they all have the kind of same uh, over-policed condition, uh, where some should be much more freer, much more, much more um, 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 funky and groovy, and others maybe more safe than they are now. So this is one of the kind of conversations, and I'm looking at this kind of feed, the way people are kind of upset about, because something is kind of privately owned. And um, yeah, they want to intervene, of course. Um, and, and, but these are beautiful, uh, vibrant spaces. Uh, uh, but I think they could be much more vibrant, much more beautiful, much more diversified uh, um, um, than, than they are now. And there are kind of private parks and there's initiatives I, I find interesting. So I'm into, interested in all this all breaking open uh, the built environment development for, for private entrepreneurship. And at the moment, it's so stifled. And uh, we come to the, what, that, what that means. By the way, I'm just showing you one of our projects where I'm saying this is a kind of startup hub, hundreds of companies with lots of food and beverages, uh, social spaces in Beijing, and uh, how I'm trying to create this kind of vibrant, three-dimensional space of simultaneity, inside, outside connections. Uh, we have our own office there, an Beijing office there as well, so kind of multi-level, straight-up public space with lots of crowds, activity, events, 
all curated and, and it's also privately run in the center of Beijing, which is otherwise kind of very stifling and you know, this windswept, empty Tiananmen Square, there's nothing else. So this is what we're delivering um, in Beijing, for instance, with events and, and my next vision is kind of towers opening up and creating this kind of interior urbanism uh, everything, thousands of, of actions and interactors in a conglomerate. We're designing this for uh, intervisible interacting. And of course, there's huge regulatory hurdles for this as well in terms of fire safety and so on. So this is kind of what I'm doing on the architectural front. And the other thing is um, this whole idea of the housing crisis and these kind of the, the, the distortions in the market which are criticized and seem to be drawing in more and more heavy-handed the planners and politicians. But I'm arguing they've been creating these. So the kind of ratio of, of how much per income you have to pay for your place, the value distribution. There's enormous amount, of course, supply restrictions and nimbyism and political interference which, which kind of distorts and makes this market totally dysfunctional. And I've been pointing this out. And then you come in, since it's all overpriced, the state comes in and wants to affordable. Now it starts to subsidize on ration. And more and more and more, now 50% every renewable is rationed, supposedly. And the threshold of people who need that is climbing, climbing at the same time. It's a kind of self-fulfilling spiral. And now when you have 90,000 pounds per annum, you're just eligible for a kind of supported, so they pick winners and losers, it's an arcane system, it's a huge waste of time. So from pointing this out, I'm vilified. The other thing is, the only thing which allows London to grow as a city, of course, they need savings from somewhere. So the world like, thinks there's a good real estate opportunity, it is vibrant. Money is pouring in, fueling the potential to deliver these required housing and real estate, which are hampered by nimbyism, but they're vilified. The foreign investment are kind of castigated and kind of slashed and, and as, as kind of a negative. So I've been pointing this out. And so what we're having looking at, we're looking at the politicians come in, have these frozen for decades exactly which patch is for residential, for commercial, for office. You can't touch this, you can't change this. Uh, down to the building, how much can be built, what can be built. Uh, it's crazy. Um, then, once it's residential, they give you the exact unit mix. How many one bedroom, how many two bedroom, how many three bedroom, how many flats per core, how many balconies. Each apartment, minimum sizes of each room, f washing machine, every item. There's nothing you can touch. And so, so, so everything is preconceived. The entrepreneurs can do absolutely nothing. When it comes to the visual communication, I said, oh, it's very important to express into an, an, an urban environment, who you are, who you attract, what you're, you know, to, to show your demeanor. They prescribe this and say, no, you have to put brick here. And, and so the, all that is left for entrepreneurs and developers is to game the system, get exceptions, uh, understand the counselor's predilections, bribery and political rent seeking. That's all there is. And then there's sometimes a loophole. A young entrepreneur, he is 27 years old, a uh, guy called Reza, uh, we're in contact with developing things. He found a loophole that you can actually do different kind of product. He calls it kind of multi-occupancy home. This is a single house with, 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 where 500 people share a bunch of living rooms, which allows you to finally go beyond these horribly far too large uh, rooms and apartments. And he creates a totally new product. And, and it's, it's a thriving and running um, um, and, and, and attracts entrepreneurship. He adds in incubator services and so on. So, so and, and, and it's a great entrepreneurial product, but it's, it's only a loophole. And then there's another loophole which, 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 which was happening. So I came out with this kind of uh, manifesto and, and, uh, to, to address these housing crises. So I said, regulate the planners. Uh, you need to start with property rights and, and really look at what, where is there potentially, uh, because there's transaction costs, etc. perhaps kind of interim need where they could come in. And, and, uh, and, and um, I said also, yeah, all this kind of land use zoning should, has to go. Um, these kind of, then the, all these milieu protections where you can't, it's also to do with land use zoning protection. Uh, all these housing incentives are ludicrous. And the housing centers where all the architects are with me because they hate, they can't work. And they find it ludicrous and it's absurd. But they're getting worse and worse. So, um, I, but I also think that whole affordability system, actually if you have, 50% of all new build rationed and you burden that on these developments because all new build work is over expensive because you, you, you basically use the leftover, the private apartments are sold, they are subsidizing the giveaways. And there's sometimes, there's something between, they're up to kind of, 
a 60% giveaway of the value. So that increases um, um, uh, uh, so the, the, the inaffordability. It's an inaffordability system, so I've been criticizing this. Of course, all this wrong-headed way of going into property ownership as a kind of financial uh, asset planning is, is as wrong as hampers mobility. And then in the end I said, um, uh, we, we have to privatize all um, uh, public spaces and squares, etc. So, so, so this is what's, um, I, what I wanted to present, and uh, I know it was a bit rapid. <laughs> and uh, just to give you a glimpse of some themes and, and threats for later discussion. Thank you. Thank you.